want to introduce Joan Neeson to our listeners. You might have read her at Sports Illustrated and any number of other outstanding uh, sports publications. And she joins us here on Halftime on Baseball Opening Day, which is weird to say on July 23rd, Joan, isn't it? It is a bit strange, but, um, you know, kind of nice to have some entertainment looming, even if I have mixed feelings about whether it should be happening, I guess. Yeah, and, and you, you point to that in the in your, your first Outside the Press Box um, newsletter uh, that, that I read yesterday uh, about the idea of, and, you know, it's, it's kind of funny, and I pointed this out earlier, the Canadian federal government won't let the Blue Jays get away with going cross-border with their opponents around this 14-day quarantine that they mandate. But certain state governments in the United States, certain city governments in the United States, they have no trouble with that. And, and therein, we are seeing, you know, di- why perhaps these two countries have had such differing, I don't know, responses or outcomes from what's happened in these last few months. Yeah, it's, the situation with the Blue Jays has been fascinating. Um, I feel, you know, I feel for the team right now. They still don't know where they're playing. Um, and their first home game is in less than a week, I believe, or maybe a little bit more than a week. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it, to me, it's what's interesting about that situation is, you know, that we all sort of assumed that the Blue Jays would be, or that Canada would be fine with the Blue Jays and their opponents, you know, popping in and out of the country for a few days at a time when all signs point to that doesn't fly with Canada. I mean, if you look at the, the NHL going up there, all of the NHL writers, players, everyone has to quarantine for 14 days when they get there. And I was, so I was sort of for a few weeks thinking, what is, what is MLB? Where is the exemption here? And it turned out there was no exemption. No one had handled it yet, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I think college football teams may be facing the same thing. You know, you've got, there are a lot of states right now that are, I don't know if imposing is the right word, but they are asking any traveler from other states, you know, any number of states to quarantine for 14 days. You know, college football teams aren't going to be able to do that. So I guess, I guess, Really, sports, essentially, the NFL is going to be asking for the same thing. All sports teams in the country are asking for exemptions, which I guess in their eyes makes them essential services. Right, um, which is which is interesting. Um, yeah, it's, it, New York has, you know, arguably some of the most restrictive quarantine laws for people coming in and out of the state. Massachusetts does as well, I believe. And um, Massachusetts hasn't come out and said anything yet about you know, what they're thinking when it comes to the Red Sox right now. And then certainly, you know, the Patriots when, when football gets started, but New York came out and said, Governor Cuomo said, you know, we deem sports professional sports teams to be um, exempt from this and essential. So sort of answers that question for MLB right now. And I guess the NFL going forward, but yeah, it's going to be a big question um, as more and more sports start up. And to be fair, we don't know when these quarantine orders are going to expire, but I mean, and I'm certainly not an epidemiologist, but things don't look good in a lot of states right now. So it doesn't seem like signs are pointing toward some of these states that have already gone through it to uh, lift those restrictions. I live in Chicago. There's a ton of restrictions here right now. Um, I have friends who had trips planned to go out west and see national parks and did so. And now we're quarantining in their homes because they, they went to some states that were off limits. Wow. It's uh and, and a lot of a lot of times, I experienced this with a vacation with family recently. Like the day before you leave, you know there can be, uh, you know, an announced quarantine on travelers coming from the state that you're traveling to. So, yeah, I mean, the, these leagues have to be. And this is what I think, co- the college football leagues that haven't made their announcements yet. You know, SEC, Big Twelve, ACC, this part of the country. You know, I think they want to leave themselves some leeway to make reactive decisions uh, based upon the, you know, what's happening right now in the country. What, you know, football wants to play 12 games. I'd be surprised if, if, if college football gets to 12 games because I think they need the leeway to be able to deal with postponements. You know, if you have to quarantine an entire, uh, an entire offensive line for a team or something like that, there are all these things that may pop up in the next few months that, I think leagues need to give themselves leeway here to uh, to be able to ship things left and right. I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I do think 12 games seems like a long shot at this point, and I think that that leeway is really smart. Um, I think we don't clearly we don't know a lot about this virus right now. We've been dealing with it for several months, but it seems like it's it, everything's pretty unpredictable. Um, so why not? To me, it seems like the best way to do it is to sort of. Put 
push your decision to the last possible moment. Make all of your contingency plans. Make all of your health and safety protocols. Have everything ready to start playing, but don't make that decision until the last possible moment so that you can really react to whatever the conditions are in that moment. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that, you know, seeing some leagues cancel their non-conference, that buys them leeway in that respect. Um, and I think that we're going to see more and more of that um, in the coming weeks. Speaking of Joan Neeson here on Halftime, Joan, I saw an article a couple days ago. I'm curious kind of where you stand on this. Let's, I mean, and like you said, there's so many unknowns with this virus and how it's being spread right now. But when you look at, I'll, I'll focus, this, focus this more on Major League Baseball, though this could encompass every sport. If the virus were to improve, do you think there could be a scenario where they may let fans into the stadiums for Major League Baseball games this season? Or, is it, or do you think it's going to stay no fans at all for the rest of the season? You know, I don't have any great reporting on that myself, but we have seen um, lots of municipalities. Um, the, I would say more than half of major league teams have said they would like to work with their local municipalities and try to get fans in the door. So you got to believe that if the conditions get to the point that those conversations can happen, they're going to happen because these teams want fans in seats. I mean, you've heard, we've heard multiple major league owners sort of cry poverty over the past few months and say, you know, what a, what a horrendous thing this is for their finances because they can't have people in seats. So I certainly think those conversations are already happening and they're going to keep happening. You know, whether, whether that actually comes to pass, I, I'm so leery to predict, but I think that, I think these teams and these owners are going to make every possible plea they can um, to make it happen. Now, I'm the positive guy of this show. Phil and Maddie T will tell you the same thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm, the, I'm the positive guy. Phil's the Debbie Downer. And I, I, it's, it's just the way it is. So let's be positive for a second. We got a season that's coming up starting tonight. I'm just curious from your standpoint, who, is, who are your favorites that we need to be looking out for in the Major League Baseball season? Oh, that's a good question. And to be honest, I feel like I have thought so much less than usual about who might win it all because I've been so focused on will this thing even start. Um, I think my, if I had to pick a World Series winner right now, I'd pick the Dodgers. Um, I think this, you know, they're, they're talented year in, year out. They, they make the playoffs every year. Um, things don't go their way. At the same time, a shortened season might really um, benefit them. I have this sort of pipe dream of, Maybe with a 60-game season, Clayton Kershaw will pitch better in the postseason. Um, I don't know if there's any logic to that at all, but that's one of my one of my postseason predictions. I would say, um, you know, other than that, I think it's such a toss-up because this this sample size we're going to have is so small. If you look at where MLB was after 60 games last season, the Washington Nationals, who won the World Series, wouldn't have made the playoffs. So it's just like you, you can't think about this like like a normal season and i feel like i struggle then to make predictions as a result but the one prediction i have is i like the dodgers you say normal season and I, I've, I've brought this up a couple times on the show in the past is this more this season is this an asterisk season because i mean you st- i mean any team but theoretically at this point i mean phil's a big pittsburgh pirates fan they're not one of the best teams in major league baseball but say they was to get hot and win at the right time they could theoretically be there but i mean can you can you honestly say that they could be a World Series champ, or is this going to be like a just a fluke here just to get baseball playing? You know, I think there's going to be a lot of conversation that this is a fluke year. I also think that conversation will happen if it's a team like the Pirates, the Reds, you know, just a smaller market team that isn't picked as a favorite. If that team surges and wins the World Series, I think there's going to be a lot of talk in the media of this is an asterisk. I think if the Dodgers or the Yankees go out there and win it, that's going to be less of a conversation. Um, I mean, I grew up in a small market. I grew up in St. Louis. I certainly, you know, don't like that that's how things work, um, but it is. So that's sort of my prediction on that front. Um, I do think it's going to come down to a lot more chance, but I think that's fun. Um, I think these are games. This is a game. Sports are games. Um, And I think this in a way might erase some of the, you know, advantages that some big market teams have and make it a little flukier, which I'm, I'm always here for. Well, let's just be honest here, Joan. Any year where the Pittsburgh Pirates finish with more wins than losses is a fluke year and should have an asterisk <laughs> next to it anyway. All right? <laughs> so being somebody from St. Louis, and I like to toy around with the St. Louis fans every once in a while, are St. Louis fans really the best in baseball or do they just think they're the best fans in baseball? Oh, you know, 
I mean, who, there's no such thing as the best fans in baseball. Thank I, you. No, like, they, no, they are in St. Louis. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. You know what? I grew up in St. Louis. I lived there the first 18 years of my life. I spend still, you know, my parents still live there. I spend a lot of time there. I've never heard anyone claim that we that, that people from St. Louis are the best fans in baseball <laughs> ever in my life. I think it's an internet thing. Um, that said, I think it's a great place to go see a ball game. I think it was a great environment in which to grow up and fall in love with baseball and sports. Um, I, I will stand by that. Um, and people are really informed there about baseball because it's, it's a weird city where it's, you know, obviously there is no NFL anymore, but even when the Rams were there, it was, it was a baseball town and that doesn't, that's not the reality in most places anymore. So yeah, there's no such thing as the best fans in baseball. Joan, tell us about the uh, the outside the press box newsletter that uh, that you've started. Uh, getting back into uh, into the column uh, idea here, what are, what are, what will be on the outside the press box newsletter, and how often will you put it out? Well, as far as how often, it's going to be at least once a week. Um, we're in week one right now, so I feel like I don't have great answers, but I I'm going to have two this week, um, and some weeks I would love to have two maybe even three um, as things ramp up and if I get some guest posts, things like that. But it's going to be, you know, a column about sports and society. You're not going to see game breakdowns or, you know, X's and O's. You're going to see COVID. You're going to see, you know, women's issues. We're going to see, you know, other ways that sports and society intersect, Um, which has always been sort of my passion in sports writing. And uh, since I left Sports Illustrated, I was laid off last fall. I've been working on a podcast. Um, full time, so I haven't been able to write at all. So for me, this is really just a fun project to get me writing again, and um, hopefully, people enjoy it. Um, I'm really looking forward to it, and you know, it, it probably will evolve over time. I probably there are probably things I'd say now. Oh, it won't be that, but it might be someday. I really want it to serve readers and to give readers maybe a perspective they're not getting elsewhere. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really evolving process, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. It's been so fun just in week one to write and get feedback and you know keep moving forward well you did great work when i read you at si uh if you're interested in signing up for joan's uh newsletter go to joanneason.substack.com and she's also podcasting at religion of sport joan love to do it again sometime thanks for joining us on halftime today thanks joan absolutely thanks for having me guys absolutely that's joan neeson joining us on halftime